Hello. Uh, so <clears throat> I would like to talk to you about writing an ultra portable game without using an engine, which is kind of important in today's times. We kind of have limited opportunities in picking engines. One and two, you need to pull the rug from under developer's feet. And there's really no reason to believe any other engine will not do that again, or Unity will not take extra steps to make our lives harder. So what I would like to talk to you about is how to make your own game engine. How can this be beneficial and save you both time, money, and resources in the long run? That said, this might not be suitable for all kinds of games, for all kinds of projects, and for all kinds of teams. So I will also tell you, one, how, and two, why you should take this approach. So you will be able to assess yourself whether this or not is a good opportunity for you. And also, this is an hour-long talk, and we have half an hour, so we will go fast. So get focused. Take some notes, maybe. So. I am Sostosovsky. I am mostly known for my Pixel series. Uh, I also made a game called Morshpit Simulator, but it's really, really bad, so don't quote me on that. I made a Doom Piano. It's a Doom that plays piano. Uh, I'm organizing Zero Hour Game Jam during the day Daylight Saving Time shift. I am co-founder with J JW and uh, Ruby. We co-founded a thing called 7 Day FPS. It's still going, hosted by Ruby. And you can take part, create a great game in seven days. Games like Super Hot or I think Heavy Bullets as well were created during 7 Day FPS. I used to be an English teacher. I love retro hardware and I also love writing MTBs. So that's me. But enough about me. I, the structure of this talk is about MacPixel 3, because I created my own engine for MacPixel 3. I released it on every single imaginable platform, and I will tell you based on my, what I will tell you is based on my experience. I don't make this up, OK? So why did I decide to use my own engine? About MacPixel engine, uh, what makes it portable, what makes uh, also how to structure your development process, like how was it structured in MacPixel Engine, and what steps to take during pre-production uh, pre to ensure scalability of the thing that you are producing, because it has to work for the entire game. Also, drawbox pitfalls, of course, and advantages, and what to consider going this way, meaning whether this is the right approach for you. So let's go. This works. Yeah. Uh, so this is MacPixel 3. It's a very simple pixelated game. Uh, it's like a point-and-click adventure. Uh, there's not much graphics, so writing my own engine, like look at this, I sh shouldn't be using like Unreal to make this. So MacPixel is this kind of superhero uh, who saves the day. So right now he boards this very Polish train and has to save the day because the train is going towards like an edge of a cliff and the rails are ending and you have 20 seconds to save it before everybody falls to their death. So you are in this room. You can grab a fish and hit the old man with the fish. But that doesn't save the day. So maybe go to the bathroom and drop the fish. And now, well, the fish is saved. It's not going to fall down a cliff, right? But the train is still going really fast towards the cliff. So what can you do? Well, you are a hero, and you're going to save the day. So you're going to jump off the window, run to the front of the train, and stop the train with your bare hands. But MacPixel is not real superhero, so everybody dies, OK? Uh, so MacPixel 3 was released in November 2002 on Windows, Mac, Linux, iPhone, iPad, Android, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Xbox One, Xbox Series, Raspberry Pi, Windows 95, Windows NT 3.51, and MS-DOS, Haiku OS, and FreeBSD. Thank you. MacPixel, this is the porting team, so I didn't do the porting for the consoles. I only did, I did everything else. But the team who was porting 22nd Century Toys, really cool guys, he can be quoted as saying, MacPixel 3 was engineered and documented in a way that made it easy to feed runtime game states into platform-specific wrappers. We supported all current game consoles and important part, much faster than we are used to with other well-known cross-platform engines. So making your own engine can be more portable than using Unity or Unreal. This is what we are seeing here. Now, how MacPixel Engine works. First of all, why did I decide to make it? What choices did I have? Unity, well, 
we don't like Unity anymore. Unreal, you've seen the game, right? Game Maker, it's kind of dodgy for consoles. I really wanted to have this portability. And Mono Game is something that I could have considered, but I know how to write my own thing, so I just did. The concerns that I had was portability, maintainability, so I can support this engine, support this game, and performance of the engine. So I wanted to be fast, and I wanted to be able to port it to every single platform. This is what I had in my head when starting writing it. So, the key priorities, portability, maintainability, and least possible dependencies. This is what makes this engine uh, easily portable. So, the dependencies of MacPixel engine is, First is STB image, is public domain. This is embedded in the engine, so it's like just ported over. It's not an external JSOS, so JSOS is just a library I wrote myself, so it's not really a uh, dependency. Give writer to save GIFs to your drive, and a wrapper library that can be SDL, Allegro for DOS, and courses if you want to display it in like Linux terminal, or Win API, or anything else. So the way it works with this and API libraries, the way it works is this is the engine. The engine is a block, it's like a library. It's written in C and it can be compiled on every single platform. You send input and you receive freight data and you render it on the screen. This is the easiest thing you can port to every single thing in existence, especially if it's written in C. You also like, you have to do audio separately, but this is something really easy. If you have like a wrapper library, it can be ported like to, I don't know, SDL or just wave out, DirectX. They all use the same. It's a buffer you feed it with audio data. It's very simple. It's the same as displaying things on the screen, it's just displaying thing on the speaker. And the file I.O., uh, it's the same for everything. Like, you just F open thing, except for, I think, Android, that you have to do a wrapper, and that's it. Very simple. So, pass input, received frame. It can be the wrapper library. Like, I can use SDL to display the frame that I receive. I can use Allegro. I can just use Windows. Uh, I can replace that part to have any single platform. That's easy, because this is, like, just a couple hundred lines of code. Audio is the same. And file I.O. is for all the platforms except Android. So the details. I have load game, update game, update input, uh, render game. And from the main file, I just call all of these. And that's it. And game output contains the frame data. I just need to call these 60 times per second. So the file structure also, to like, reduce the number of like, defines and if devs, I just have different files for different platforms that I just like, I keep in, in the make files and the projects. And the build system is also really easy. So I have project make files and project files for every single platform uh, differently. I keep the pre-compiled dependencies like SDL and stuff like that. And I have scripts to build it, build, package, test, and deploy. So I just call the build and I also have Jenkins set up because having like 20 over, over 20 platforms with like different architectures is a lot. So I have Jenkins just call the scripts for me and deploy to all the platforms that I need. But with this many platforms, you also need testing and you can automate the testing. So with MacPixel, I have a thing that reads a script. So I have a script like which item on the screen you should click and what you should check, and the script runs and plays the entire game automatically. It looks like this. It just plays the game at 2,000 FPS, 30 times normal speed. So in 20 minutes, it beats the game from A to Z, 100%ing it, and making sure that it is absolutely beatable. So any like really obvious bugs, like a missing file or stuff like that, can be caught within that. That's how I can test and deploy on all the platforms automatically without having to play the game through. Now, a porting example, RISC-V is like a new processor architecture. It's kind of unprecedented. Not really games, no games, commercial games have been released on that. So what I need to do is plug this in, install Linux. I get the build files so I can build. I get the SDL because that's what I use for most platforms that support SDL that includes Linux on RISC-V. And I need some version to just pull the repository. So I execute build, and that's it. Uh, I, this is like a video of me, of me doing that. I plugged in. This board is called, uh, it's called Vision Five, something. They like they come out every month, and the support for them is really low. I mean, these are like really experimental kind of new processor architecture that's only like for enthusiasts. So I call build shell generic platform for Risk Five, 
and then I have, uh, it's for Linux, it's for desktop, I use GCC, I use grisc 5 architecture, and it doesn't have CPU ID instruction. I execute that, this is sped up now, it builds. This is my first attempt. It built, and then I type bin slash macpixel, and now because this is bin slash macpixel3. It just works. It works on everything. Like, it's so easy to port if you have your own engine. But, to the point, how can you, oh, also, if you want, it's available on all the platforms on itch, like for the Risk v for Linux, for DOS, for Windows 95, and you go to itch page and you can check it out yourself. It does work. So, how do you ensure that the engine is portable? The library, we talked about that, the library-like approach, the load dependencies, we talked about that, but software rendering is the main point. This is why, this is how to make the most portable engine. And also using C, C++ works too, but I really like C, and how to use memory management. I mean, you need to do that myself, yourself. And the premeditated bottom-up approach, how to approach creating your own engine from scratch, because that's something that most people have not done before. First, software rendering. Sorry for going really fast, but we're really running out of time. So, people think that software rendering is really, really complicated thing for really old de game devs with like long beards who've been around for decades. No, this is a blit function. It draws images on the screen. How many lines is that? Less 20? Okay, it is calling, it, it does have this macro. This is the macro. Look at that. This is the macro. It's just a bunch of ifs. It clips. So it doesn't render like overboard because you can like mess up your memory. And you have this sauce CPI, like what's that? Look, that is 10, that is 10 lines of code. This is just copying bytes from one place to another. This is very simple. Everybody can write that. It's not hard. There's like, this is it. This is software rendering. It works. It renders images on the screen. Now, okay, okay, but I want effects, okay? So you can have different types, like with do some simple bits shift math and have different like additive, subtractive, shadows, and stuff like that. That's just another hundred lines of code. Then, okay, okay, but I want transforms. I want rotating and scaling. Okay, you do red rotating and scaling. You do matrix operations. That's not hard. You can have rotating and scaling sprites. But okay, I want to render lines and primitives. Okay, just write it. This is a function that renders lines. It's like you can, you can look it up on Wikipedia. It's like the, in, there's a pseudocode on Wikipedia. You just type that in and you have lines that render. But okay, I want to render 3D images. Okay, this is the function that renders 3D images and it's like 200 lines of code and renders 3D triangles. So it's 200, 2,500 lines of code total to have all of this in your game. That's not a lot. Like game code bases are 100,000 lines of code. Now, methods of software rendering. I got like, you know, software rendering has to look good. So I have like parallax scrolling. I have this old like ultra like, this is all from MacPixel, all ultra like uh, scaling. I have this ray casting that looks kind of 3D-ish. I have this effects like water like effects, uh, additive effects that look like lights and 3D rendering. You can have all of that in software rendering. You can have all of that in the game. Now, step by step, how does it look like? Like, so you can imagine it. This is how you draw a like GTA-like uh, 3D environment. It looks 3D, but look at it. It's not really 3D. I just like take these lines that go from the center and copy it. This is like when you, when you look at this GIF and you're a programmer, you can see in your head how this works. This is not 3D. It's just as I'm casting lines from the center. This is like one point perspective that you draw on a piece of paper, but you do that, you make the computer do that. And it looks like this. This is also in MacPixel. It's not 3D. You don't have to do 3D to be 3D. There's also like MacPixel benchmark and MacPixel, but we don't have time for that. Uh, now, performance of software rendering. It works. MacPixel 3 works 60 frames per second easily. This is the lowest denominator on Pentium 3, 800 megahertz from 1999. But you can also play it on Pentium MMX with 233 megahertz from 1997. This is it working on like an old laptop that I bought. And this is it, MacPixel 3 working on a 3, 486 DX2 with 66 megahertz processor from 1993. But can we go lower? Of course we can go lower because this is MacPixel running on a hand 
386 from AliExpress. That's 40 megahertz, 386 processor and eight megabytes of RAM. Of course, it's one FPS. It doesn't, it's not really playable anymore, but it does work. You can make your game run on literally everything, and I'm not even trying really hard. Now, caveats. So I am updated. I have uh, done this presentation before, but I have updated it with, uh, with new findings because I am using now this engine to create a new game, and I am discovering new things, new ways to optimize, and new ways to utilize software rendering to create better things. So. I said before that it's suboptimal HD performance, that it's really, really hard to create a game in HD resolution because it needs over 14,000% processing power. No, but if you utilize SIMT optimization like AVX, SSE, stuff like that. So this is, this engine rendering 10,000 sprites in one thread in nine milliseconds on my laptop battery. So it's like, this is not the best hardware ever, and I can do that. This easily can render like any kind of game, 2D game that you can think of, like mobile games, simple games, stuff like that. No anti-aliasing. Well, you can use FXIA. So what FXIA does is doesn't do multi-sampling. It kind of averages the pixels, just samples the pixels that are already on the screen. You can have that in process, and you can have enough performance to be able to do that. Now. I said that it's usable mostly for pixel art game, boomer shooters. Well, it's easiest to utilize this method for that kind of games. But with these kind of optimizations, you can use that for anything. And it's not much use for 3D games. Well, I kind of worked on my 3D engine, and now I have loading Quake 3 maps with light maps and everything, and this is rendering also smoothly on anything. So you can use software rendering for everything. This is not only about these optimizations. This is also about compilers getting better and processors getting so fast that they're just too fast and you can have all this extra power to harness here. So, possible fixes for the non-problems that we had. First, method optimization. I already did that. So instead, for example, instead of rotating, you have this three shares. You know, sharing is like doing the this kind of thing with a rectangle. So you do one share, two shares, and three shares, and you have a rotated sprite. I implemented that. It's faster and more pixel perfect. Uh, assembly routines, that's a bad idea because you do want portability. This is what this is about. So I tried it. It's not faster. Simt. You can use Simt. So if you write it like that, look, I have like zero to eight. Compiler can enroll this, these loops and use the single instruction multiple data, like AVX2, for example, or SSE4, to have faster blitz. This is what made the uh, previous slide like, uh, invalid, because I utilized that, and the new compilers allowed me to do that. Also, you can have multi-threaded rendering. I tried doing that myself, but also the compiler now can do that uh, for yourself as well. Like the MSVC can do uh, this kind of option switch, and if you trust the compiler, like you do, you need to have this, this is important, the struct member alignment for AVX, and then you just enable AVX and enable parallel compiling, and it becomes blazingly fast, even on older PCs. It's amazing, really. So, also, I'm using C. Uh, of course, you can use C++. I'm mostly using C just because I like C, but I know that most developers come from Unity, come from C Sharp, from Manage It, from managed languages, so I'm gonna talk quickly about how C is not that scary. So, why did I pick C? First, I chose C99. Uh, it is the most portable contemporary language. It works like Arduino even. Compiles on everything, behaves predictably. It is well-established standard. It has been around and is set in stone for years, unlike C++ that's changing. Good compiler support, everything supports C99. Easy to write and read. It's a bit easier than C++ as well. Uh, maybe not as easy as C Sharp. And it is comp compatible with all the libraries. Even the C++, I can just write a simple wrapper. Now, why not C++? No need to go C++ for a 2D game that's first. It really is function overloading as compilation complexity and coding complexity. There are more things that you need to remember, and I just 
didn't want to have that kind of technical depth in my game. STL licensing is issue on exotic platforms. This is just for DOS. I really wanted the game to work on DOS. That's it. And there are no anonymous tracts and unions and union initialization. I will show you that in a moment. That's really important and something I use a lot in the game and that works really well for game dev. Now, why not C-sharp? Oh, I could do C-sharp. So C-sharp is patented. You probably didn't know that because you need to pay the patents. And the patent exception is for mono. You can use mono, but only in whole. So the whole package of mono is 200 megabytes of DLLs, and MacPixel 3 is 150 megabytes. So it just, I didn't want to use that. I thought about that, but it just doesn't make sense. Now, the good stuff. I will show you how C is not scary. This is like a for each macro. You can have for each in C if you write macros. I use macros a lot. They are like templates in C++, but kind of different. But you can have everything. If you just remember to name the things, look, I need to have the stages and the num stages. And it uses that kind of naming scheme to create the macro for me. If I just keep that, I can have things like fill parse. So it, just, it takes stuff from JSON it parses the JSON and it creates entities for me and fills all this data with one line of code that I don't have to repeat. I just need to remember to have proper naming for the structures and for the, uh, for the functions as well. And if I have a different name, suddenly I can just do a define to create the name that will work with my macro. Uh, and I can have it parsing the backgrounds, the rooms and animations. Uh, same, I can use find, it works just like for each, but it finds the item with the name within a list. Just by keeping the naming, uh, the naming and the name, I need the name variable inside the struct, and that is, that's it. I can have unions that are, and structs that are uh, anonymous. So look at the struct, it doesn't have a name. You cannot do that in C++, this is only in C. Uh, it's same, it works for like things like point, but it also works like player, so I have, I can have a part of the struct that is anonymous and use that to copy only a part of the struct. It kind of, it doesn't make sense in, in where you have inheritance, but you don't have inheritance in C, so you have to use tricks like that to like, to keep the player type, like the clothes that he wears, but you need to move around his uh, coordinates around different structures, so you can do that easily. Uh, and then uh, you can use stuff like that. This is uh, initialization. You cannot do that in C++. You just do sprite is this, x is this, y is this, is this that, and it is on. And I have like a entity on the screen thanks to that. In C++, you need to write a constructor. Of course, you still always write a constructor, but in C, you can do that. It's really helpful, and also you can do this kind of initialization inside a function parameter. This is a big no-no in any other language. Only C can do that. So basically, this is a macro that does not struct, but array initialization. So I have an inline array. This is really cool when I need to create an animation with a list of frames, and I do not need to declare it anywhere else. I can just put it inside my code. It's really, really helpful. And then, uh, stuff like getting stuff from like an entity pool is like, it is really simple. It is as simple as you make it on this. The bad thing is no operator overloading kind of sucks in 3D because you need to do stuff three times. String operations are kind of, you need to use the printf and stuff like that. Sometimes it doesn't, well, when C crashes, that's great. It's a bug. Okay, the bug is here, I fix it. But when it doesn't crash, that's the big problem because it will corrupt your memory and destroy everything and crash somewhere else and you will be like, what is happening, and it's really hard to track. But that's not really a problem because, well, some misconceptions, and I will get to the point in a moment. C is a subset of C++. That's not true because C11 is different. C won't compile as C++, C++ won't compile as C. They are now a days different languages. Macros are hard. No, you can expand them inline and debug them. That's not hard. You can also do change warnings to errors. This is what I have in my every single project. I change some warnings to errors. Thanks to that, things that can break in C are harder to break. And memory management is hard. Well, it is not because you have native corruption detections. This is like the place where it wouldn't crash. If I enable this in Visual Studio, it will crash. 
So it will not crash, it will like trigger the breakpoint, and I will be able to debug every, every memory corruption. So it makes it really easy. And compilers doesn't support modern variety, they do. Microsoft Visual Studio is the, like the last one to pick up new standard, but now it supports C17, the kind of newest. There's also C23, but it's like, it's not really there yet anywhere. And C17 is great, and now it supports it, and I'm using it, and it's great. No, memory management. Since you're writing your own engine, you need memory and resource, of course, management. And it seems hard, like, I need to do that myself? Well, here's the thing. You load the level for your game, and you pull everything. So, like, every single memory that you unlock, you throw into a single array. And then, when you unload, you just go through the array and free everything. That's it. Here we go. Memory management. It takes two lines of code. Ta-da. This is what it works. It's just four things that you need to write, still 100 lines of code. It is extra work, but this takes care of your memory management. Uh, you can have, like, uh, in your structures, you can have, like, extra stuff to use in your macros, like, is it pooled, is it in a pool or not, or is it maybe an external pointer that I declared somewhere else and I should not remove it, and then have some macros that do that for you. So you call, like, create sprite, and I know, like, maybe I can pass the sprite that already exists here and do not create a new one, and then I use the macro to check that for me because of these two and I have no memory leaks. And I mean, this works on an eight megabyte of memory computer, so it cannot have memory leaks, really. Now, the drawbacks. Not suitable for open world games. The thing is, MacPixel uses like 200 megabytes of memory at max. You can just load the entire world in your memory. Computers, like, I mean, cell phones have six gigabytes of memory. You can just load everything and just use whatever you need. You don't need to unload and load stuff at whim, just load everything. Cleaning up takes time. Well, you can pool the memory. So you just like have a pool, load a lot of things, and just pick them from memory as well. You do not have to load at runtime. Now, how low can you go with memory? And this is the answer. This is hand 386 with eight megabytes of memory running MacPixel. It's as little memory as you use because there is no overhead. The only overhead is your game because you are writing your own engine. So whatever you want to have in your game, this is the only thing that takes place in the memory. You don't have like the Unity engine running in the background, physics, doing physics that don't exist in your game and stuff like that. You just do what you need. Okay, and now the important part, pre-production. How to make sure when starting doing an engine that you are doing it right, that you are doing the right thing. It says time is up, but it's lunch break, and everybody hates lunch, so I'm going to take like just five more minutes. Hope that's okay, because this is really important. This is the most important part. So planning the engine. Who is it for? First, 2D games. If you are making a 2D games, consider this. If you're making pixel art, definitely do this. Boomer shooters, definitely do this. Retro-inspired games, like racing strategy, stuff like that. Simple mobile games, definitely do this. Low-poly 3D games, definitely do this. Thanks to this, you will have your own code base that you can use for the next engine and the next game, and you do not have to pay Unity fees, Unreal fees, or like have any kind of technical debt. This will help you in the long run. It is not a thing that you make for one game. This is a thing that you make for life. Now, but since you are making this for life, you want to have the right approach. So what I do and what I suggest you do, you have the pre-prod stage, the pre-production. You make the prototype in existing tech. You are using Unity, launch up Unity, make the game, and then after you maybe go to a publisher and like pitch it and start real production, this is when you take everything that you make, take the content, make sure that the content is possible to reload that elsewhere, like don't use Unity scenes in this, but like have a list, maybe a JSON that loads or an XML, that you can load later from a thing that you wrote yourself. So make the prototype in whatever you want, and then rewrite everything from scratch. So you can take the content and have it work in your thing. This is the most important part, because if you start from scratch making your own engine, you do not know what you need yet. You only know what you need when you made the vertical slice, and this is how you like, approach planning on that. You need to have something to base your plan on, right? You can be like, hey, how much time is gonna make the game gonna take? Okay, it's gonna take a year. No, I don't know. I'm gonna spend a month making a part of this game, and then I know this is 
5% of this game, and it took a month, so it will take 20 months to make the full game, plus maybe extra, so 24 months, so that's two years. Now I know. Start making the thing in the old, in the old tech that you know, and then only write, rewrite everything from scratch later. It will still save you time. And now, the general hint, this is what I said, to measure the exact time, need to complete a development task, do a subset of said task, and compare against previous estimates. That's how you know how long and how much effort will a thing take. Uh, so MacPixel 3, the prototype was made in Flash. I made it in Flash, and then I rewrote everything from scratch. This is, what I did. This is a part in Action Script. It is the same look. It's the room, the animations, the backgrounds. This is what I've shown you before. It's real. Now, planning the engine. Pitfalls. What pitfalls can you pay? First, don't try to make general purpose tools. You can make later make them general purpose or purpose change the purpose for a different game. First, make tool for your game. You are only making one game. Do not overscape scalability. This is the same thing. You do not want extra stuff that you may or may not use. Do not optimize what you don't need to. This is going to be blazingly fast. You do not need to op waste time optimizing. And also component system, you do not do that. Don't do that. This, leave that for Unity of Unreal. Look, so this is, component system is the pyramid scheme. It's going gonna, it's gonna to scam you. So this is the engine. And look, now you have entities, and there are like three times more of these. And then you have components, and look how many are there now. Because every entity has a lot of components, and now all the components need to have members, and there are even more of them. So that adds like the extra layer and exponentially increases the effort and the resources you need to invest in your own engine. You do not do component system. Now, advantages of uh, having your own engine made. The final 10% takes 10%. When I was making MacPixel, like, there's like suddenly, it's the end of development, and you need to change something really deep in the engine. Or like, when you make Unity games, have you, if you ship the Unity games, you know that like at the end you need to work around the closed source of Unity because there is maybe a bug or something unexpected that it does, and it takes a lot of time to track that down. No, this is your code. And also, the code base is much smaller than a big engine like Unreal that you cannot really dive into. So you just go there, you know where everything is, and you fix it. It takes very little time. It does save you a lot of time in the long run. No royalties. You pay nobody. This is for you. And you can use that for your future games. And you don't need the workarounds, as I said. There is nothing to work around. Everything is done by you. You can fix everything. And porting is a breeze. MacPixel ported to everything with very, very low effort. And you have control of every pixel. This is like a bragging right. Like, look at these pixels I made. The computer draw every single one of them. This is me. All right. And the last thing is when you make your own engine, it is environmentally friendly. Because you don't have giant Unreal Engine that maybe the parts of it you do not use. Or you do not have a giant Unity Engine with physics that you don't use or resource management that you don't use. Or like HDRP or URP or whatever. It is just not there. Your game only does what you need to do. So it uses very little energy. Thanks to that, less abstraction layers. You have native code. Unused features do not exist because you do not, they don't compile if you don't use them even. And less battery usage for mobile. This is like a real life performance. MacPixel 3 can be beaten on Steam Deck on a single charge and it takes seven hours. Steam Deck will discharge in two and a half hours when you play Elden Ring or Arabic game. MacPixel can be played the entire game through. Same with your phone. People are more likely to pick up your mobile game if it doesn't drain their battery with like a whirlwind inside. So this is, this is something that it goes for you and your game. And of course, the environment, so we can have like, you know, more sustainable environment because we use less energy. And if you think about it, is there like a billion people on Earth playing overscoped Unity and Unreal games? How much extra energy does it use? If we all made our own engines, we will save the planet. And of course, the production cost can be also lowered, so you can buy like 2011 ThinkPads for your team because your engine is in Visual Studio and you know you don't have to open Unity anymore. So yeah, no, just kidding. But okay, that's it. That's the end. I didn't work much over time. Thank you very much. Thank you for this great talk. It was really intense and really educational. Uh, here's a question. I, I think we still have time for. One. Yep. 
Thank you for your presentation. My name is Ivan, lead, uh, like head of the engineering in Lucifer Data Labs. So the question is, uh, do you know the approximate number of the active users of your engine right now, or you are like the only user? I'm the only user. The engine is not public. I made it for myself right now. I mean, it's, it's not really an engine. It's a MacPixel. For now, it's just a MacPixel engine. You can run MacPixel in it, nothing else. OK, right. So uh, do you consider a possibility of converting it to the public usable engine at some point or something? I would love to do that. And I am looking into it. But there is nothing I can, there is nothing I can say right now because it's like really hard. It's a, it is grown to be a huge code base. It's like 100,000 lines of code. But I would love for other people to use it. OK, got it. Thanks. Yep. Anybody else? If, if you're shy, I will also be outside right answering here. your questions after that. So don't worry. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, thank you. Uh, it's a bit technical, but uh, I just got curious. Uh, on the one of the earlier slides, you mentioned you wrote your own version of memcpy function. Mm -hmm. uh, why did you do that? Uh, why didn't you use this? Oh, oh, I have, I have the answer. It's very simple. So uh, memcpy copies the memory, but I want to copy the memory, but ignore transparent pixels. This is the only thing that I changed. Like, look at this. It's, uh, it ignores the transparent pixels. That's, that's why I wrote my own. Okay. Thank you.